Colossians chapter number 3, verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon earth. That includes your mouth, your tongue, your lips, your eyes, your ears, your hands and your feet. Amen. Anybody know what Romans 6, 13 says? Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness, right? But yield 613. You, you, you yield your members as instruments of righteousness. Your members are instruments for righteousness. Your feet ain't made to take you to the wrong place. Your hands ain't made to touch and do the wrong things. Your mouth ain't made to talk and brag about the wrong things. It's about for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Man, I seen a verse on that the other day. I better not get into it. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. What's God going to do to the people that practice this that's lost? He's going to send them to hell if not put them through the great tribulation if they make it that long. You understand? These are practices of children that don't obey God. That it, these are practices that His children aren't supposed to be in. We're not supposed to be participants of these things. But sadly, God's children become participants of this. Now listen, it's one thing to commit a sin. It's another thing to practice it over and over and over and over and over again. It's one thing that when you get saved, you're in slop and filth and corruption, and, but there's some, somebody ought to be inside enlightening you and say, hey, uh, we're not to do this no more. We're not to talk like this no more. I mean, the Holy Ghost came in me and it said, cut your hair. The Holy Ghost told me to do that. Hey, Amen. Nobody told me, hey, boy, don't you know it's shame for a man to have long hair? Nobody said that to me. When I got saved, all of a sudden, all that stuff on the back of my neck just... It just Something didn't feel right, and I said, Mom, cut my hair. She said, what? I said, Mom, cut my hair. She said, who are you? <laughs> I fought her forever about getting the hair. She said, I ain't touching it. That's all it is is a fight. I said, take me somewhere. I'll cut it myself. Something happened. When I got saved. I wanted my hair cut. How did I explain that? I can't explain that. Some, somebody moved inside me and said, hey, you know that tongue? No more cussing. Who said that? I love cussing. I love cussing people out of cash registers. It didn't matter. I loved it. That's why I got false teeth. I love cussing. I love telling people what I thought. I love giving them a piece of my mind. I didn't care about the consequences. And the, the, worst, the, the more four-letter words I could throw at you, the better it was. All of a sudden, I got saved, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost said, Hey, 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 hey you, don't, you don't let none of the bad words slip out of your mouth anymore. All of a sudden, the name of Jesus Christ being blasphemed bothered me. Amen. It, nothing, that never bothered me before. All of a sudden, I hear somebody rip one, and I go, man, I, I can't believe I heard that. I mean, all of a sudden, something happened to me, and filth and corruption and all that junk now was a reproach to me, to where before I just wanted to swim in it, right? But now, all of a sudden, it's, it's a reproach. And God began to work on me, and the practice of sin began to leave my life. And uh, God said, this, you're going to be my child. You're going to walk different. You're going to talk different. You're going to live different. You're not going to go out and practice sin wearing my name. It ain't going to happen. Amen? I, I believe that ought to happen a whole lot more. And when I find a lot of people that profess to be saved out there in the full-blown practice of sin and there's no woodshed experience, I said, hmm, that probably ain't one of his. Amen? Right? The Bible said they're bastards and not sons, right? Listen, God ain't going to waste his time spanking the devil's children. But he'll take his children to woodshed. I have a problem with God's children uh, or professing to be God's children. And uh, they, they, they pretend to be a little kitty cat, but they got a real bad stinker involved in them. So they're probably a skunk. Right? But they pretend to be a kitty cat, but they're not. They're, they're a little cat that comes with his own perfume bottle, but it's not perfume. <laughs> You understand? And everywhere they go, they cause a stink. So something ain't right about that thing. You understand? When I was a little kid, I seen a skunk, and I'm going, gee, 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 gee. I thought it was a cat. <laughs> I, I didn't know any different. 
Well, to maybe a, a new baby. In Christian, a child, uh, a small young Christian may not know the difference. And they may want to pal around with some of them guys, may not know the difference. But a mature Christian, he said, a guy, he's a skunk. He can tell right off the bat. Amen. You say, how do you get that? Walking with the Lord, spending time with the Lord. Amen. Getting your discernment, right? Having your senses exercised, you can discern some things. The reason why people don't have is not because they don't study the Bible. It's not because they don't read the Bible. It's because they don't use the Bible. They don't apply what they're hearing. They don't apply what they're reading. They don't apply what they're doing. Listen, the Bible's talking about as a soldier there. Unskillful in the word of righteousness. You know what that means? He don't know how to use his Bible. Yeah. He's unskillful, lacks skill. Listen, if I was to have a guy come in here tonight and have a sword and we were to fence, I don't know how to do all that stuff. I just, I just hack and slash and try to, try to whack his head off, and he'd have fun with me. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> he, he'd have his way with me, right? Because I'm unskilled in having, handling a sword, a physical sword. Amen. And uh, listen, the same thing with fighting. You see, I see a lot of guys want a street fight. They'll wear themselves out in about three minutes, and the guy that knows how to fight, he'll duck, he'll duck, and then once that little dude wears down a little bit, he just goes, boom, <laughs> and it's over with. I mean, they know how to fight. And uh, I'm talking about somebody that's skillful. And uh, there's a lot of people that's got great talents and talent people off. They are skilled and talent people off. I mean, the Bible says they sharpen their tongue, they wet their tongue, amen? It's like taking a whetstone. <laughs> I mean, they, they practice on sticking at people and hurting people and cutting people. And uh, listen, you, they might be able to stand, stand a little bit when you try to witness to them. But as soon as they get it, as soon as the, it's over the banks, they can't handle it. They just start resorting to name calling, saying a bunch of things, make a big scene and try to throw all kinds of blemish and stuff on you. So you walk away with a shame. Amen. Because a real Christian don't really want to argue. We don't want to make a scene. We just want to reach somebody for Jesus. Amen. They want to make a scene. And they get a big commotion going on. One day I was downtown and a big commotion come on. And, I, and a black guy was in my face. And, and, uh, and I said, I love you. He said, you don't love me. I'm black. He said, if you, you let me give me some money so I can buy drugs. And I mean, he's being belligerent. He is running his mouth. And I mean, everybody on 3rd and Main is watching this scenario unfold. And I'm standing there. And uh, I look down at the scriptures, and the Bible says, Rebuke not a scorner, lest you, you get yourself a, a blot or something like that. I can't remember what it says. Huh? No. And, and so you get a blot, and I look down, so the Lord just told me to keep my mouth shut. And the next thing you know, the RTA bus pulls up. That guy gets on the bus. He's sticking his head out the window, screaming at me as, he's, as the bus drives away. You said, and I felt like an idiot. I'm standing right there. I said, all I did, man, is try to be nice to the guy. And I said, hey, man, I love you. I ain't trying to cause no problem. And boy, he just railed on me. The more I tried to reach him, the more he railed and went off. Next thing you know, I got about 12 people gathered around me in a circle. And they said, what was that all about? And I said, let me tell you, I was trying to tell them about Jesus Christ. And I got to open up the Bible and talk to about 12 people standing around See, that day God used that thing Amen. for his glory and for his honor. Yeah, I had to take an approach. Yeah, I had to take a little cussing. But you know what? Uh, he used it for good. And uh, that's one of the times it worked out in my life. Usually I got to walk away, you know. You walk away. You ever see Big Chuck and Houlihan? You guys probably never seen it. It's something up in Cleveland. They put on little skits on Friday nights, and they had or Saturday nights. Can't remember, and they'd always put in skits on, but in between Frankenstein and Dracula and mummy movies and all that, and they they put on all these little skits. Well, they had this one called uh, Dueling Accordions. You know, you've heard of dueling banjos, and so they get these guys and they get to playing the accordions because it's up in the Polish community and they did kibasi kid <laughs> shows and stuff. And they're up there and they're dueling. This guy does his accordion bit. And then another guy, he does his accordion bit, and then the other guy, he comes back, and he does his accordion bit, and then the challenger boy, he's really going after, and all of a sudden, whoosh, the thing breaks. He drops his head like this, and he's walking down the street, and that accordion hanging in two pieces, you know, and they're all laughing at him as he walks away. Well, sometimes when I go soul winning, that's the way I feel. I've been out there sparring for the Lord, and all of a sudden, I'm kind of walking away, my head down, because I was made to look like an idiot, because the crowd doesn't want to hear it and all the lost jump in on that thing and then they all want to mock you and ridicule the Christian 
And you know what? God's getting glory and honor out of it that we stood up for the truth. And I may hang my head sometimes in defeat, but you know what? The word won't go back void. And God will accomplish what he wants to. And maybe we didn't win the battle that day. Maybe we didn't get the victory that day. But you know what? God was honored and glorified in spite of our witness. And that witness, that person will never be able to escape that. Alan Jones said this to a man one time. He said, yes, sir, you may be able to whip me, but you can't whip what I'm saying. Amen. <laughs> Listen, they can't whip this book. They can't whip the words of this book. And you may not be able to adequately always be able to defend this book. But you know what? We're supposed to try. And we're to stand up for the word. And when we stand up for the word, amen, they'll know there's a difference. Listen, be skillful. You know how you do it? You got to practice saying it. You got to practice using it. You got to apply the book. You got to practice. You got to practice. Listen, that's the only way you'll be skillful in it. You'll never be skillful in it any other way. And you know what? Upon that point right there is where you develop discernment. Right? The Bible said that you may be able to discern good and evil. A lot of people can't discern good and evil because they're never skillful. They never try to apply and use what they know. Amen? And that's what you got to do. Dr. Ruckman said this. He said the reason why he believed God gave him so much revelation and everything is because he told what he knew. God would give him something, he'd give it out. God give him something, he'd give it out. God give him something, he'd give it out. God give him something, he'd give it out. He said a bunch of people want to hoard it and they never want to pass it on. And uh, he said that ain't no good. He said he, he believes God kept giving him stuff because he kept using it and sharing it. Amen. <laughs> All right. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on who? The children of disobedience. You want to compare that to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. Amen. I love Ephesians chapter 2. If you want to be a strong Christian, you want to be a good witness, you'll never go wrong going to Ephesians chapter 2 and just reading a passage to a sinner. Amen. It's got time elements in it. It's got past and present. It's got now. It's got salvation. It's got all kinds of things. Ephesians chapter 2 is one of the greatest passages of Scripture a Christian can ever use. Verse 1, And you, if you're saved, hath he what? Quicken, that means made alive, who were dead, past tense, in trespasses and sin. That's where sinners at. Yep. He's in trespasses, he's in sins, he's in unbelief. Where in a time past you walked according to what? The course of the world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh who? In the children of disobedience. You see that? There's a there's a foul, wicked spirit. Who is that? It's the devil. The devil's working in the children of disobedience. He's working in lost people. You know what the lost people's going to get? They're going to get the reward of their father, the devil. What's the devil going to get? Hell was created for who? The devil, the devil and his angels. And listen, mankind wants to follow the devil, then they're going to have to pay the devil's price. They'll have to spend eternity with their father that they've chosen. Amen. Among whom? Also what? We all had our conversation in time past. Listen, he's saying this is the recipe of every one of us. Every one of us were lost and undone and children of the devil before we got saved. And he's trying to show you there's a vast difference. When somebody gets saved, it's from death to life. There's, there's been a resurrection in somebody's life. They're alive now. And he's saying, you know what? Now you're a child of obedience, a child of God. The devil's children are disobedient. They won't obey. Amen? Listen, that's a big sign for somebody that wants to do right. Amen? Will they, will, will they obey or not obey? Right? Well, I didn't get no amens on that. I'm, your guys' is obedience slacking a little bit? Huh? Isn't it? Right? Amen. Amen. Among whom we all had also all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and mind. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. See, you understand that? It's a natural thing. A natural man. A natural man will do what he thinks right in the flesh and in his mind. He don't have no spiritual understanding. He's dead. So he's going to do what he thinks right. I feel, I think, I think. Well, what's the book say? Yeah. 
A child of God's got to go against his feelings and against his thoughts, and he's got to go against the current of the world's flow, and he's got to realize, wait, God said this, and he's got to go against the grain. He's got to go against the current. And everybody's pulling them, and the current's pushing them. And sometimes the current gets strong. It might want to push them back a little bit. But he's still got to make headway towards God because God said, go this way. He said, go contrary to the world. And when a person gets saved, that's what we're supposed to do. Amen. We're not supposed to just live for the, our own lust and our own flesh and do whatever we want to do and whatever makes you feel good, do it. That's totally wrong Christian philosophy. But that's what all these new age churches are doing. Hey, man, do whatever you want to do. Let's just let it all hang out, man. That's, that's not good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's bad news. That ain't what God said. So, listen, we're talking about a nature. We're talking about two natures. I got a new nature inside me. There's somebody inside me who says, Son, you don't do that no more. You don't say that no more. You don't go that way no more. Mortify your members. Kill it. Don't appease it. Don't give in to your flesh. Your flesh is going to want you to come. Listen, your flesh is going to want you to put on a pair of shorts, take your shirt off, and stand up there on a the roof and roof with all the other boys out there and get a tan and be just like everybody else. But it takes a little something to sit back. Hey, I'm not going to show my nakedness off. I don't care how many workers are out here or not out here. Well, there ain't no women out here. Stop. Don't get naked. You understand? There's a standard. There's something within. Well, I'm going to sweat. Then sweat. You understand? Listen, it's, it's been tough. It's been hard. But you know what? It's easy to go downstream with all the other dead fish. But I don't want to. I, a live fish swims up against the current. Listen, it, you got to make unpopular decisions. You have to stand and do right. Everybody wants an easy way out today. You know what? It's not always an easy way out as a Christian. Amen. You know what a Christian should be looking for? According to Earl Hughes, what? What Earl Hughes say? He said, ask for the hardest task. He said, you got two tasks in front of you? He said, take the hardest. He said, why? The world's always looking for the easy way out. He said, take the hardest task. He said, get in the back of the line. He said, yeah, get in the back of the line. At least you're in the line. <laughs> he said, why do we got to fight to get in front of the line all the time? He said, get in the back of the line. Take the hardest task. He said, listen, you're a Christian. Amen. You ought to be able to accept those kind of responsibilities, those kind of duties, without complaining. What did Alan Jones say about children obeying? Huh? And like it. And like it. You understand? Children obey your parents and, Lord, what? and like it. Listen, when you accept your responsibility and say, this is it, I don't care. I was sweeping at the shop, and, I, and our room was divided up into four sections, and I swept my section and another section for somebody else, and this guy only swept a little bit, and he took off and left. And I said, Lord, I can't even believe that. He goes, who's the Christian around here? I got it. <laughs> I swept, went around, swept, swept three-fourths to the shop. Why everybody else bailed out, went somewhere. Why? He said, who's the Christian? The hardest task. You understand? We shouldn't be always looking for easy ways out, layouts, shortcuts. That's what the world does. The Lord tells us to, listen, Alan, or Don Green preached one of the greatest messages that I ever heard, the holier the harder. He talks about the sins of Korah, uh, Korah uh, Kohath or Korah, the guys that had charge of the tabernacle furniture. They had to carry all that furniture. Right? They're the Israelites that carried it all. Others had ox carts. Others had wagons that they could haul all that stuff. These guys had to put the burden on their shoulder and carry it. And Don Green got up and preached on holier the harder. He said, hey, man, you want to be holy? It's going to be harder. Oh, man. <laughs> That's tough. Yep. Hey, Amen. But here's the thing that comes with holiness. If you're really getting holy and you're getting close to the Lord, it shouldn't bother you that others aren't. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't go sit back and say, well, I'm dressed right. How come nobody else is dressed right? It shouldn't be that way. Right. You say, I'm dressed right whether, no matter what anybody else does. Amen. doesn't matter what anybody else does. But it's a little bit different if I'm called to preach it. You understand? But I've sat in churches and I've lived it for years. And now God says, it's your turn to get out and preach it. It's your turn to stand up and leave a landmark for others to follow. Amen. It's my responsibility now to stand up and cry out about it. 
I've listened to all those old men of God preach. Don Green preached on holiness is born in the womb in the morning. Boy, I don't preach, man. <laughs> My old Don Green preached hard on holiness. Everybody laughed that old man to death. But he happened to have five children all in the ministry and all his grandchildren in the ministry and they're all serving God, living for God. Hmm. I wonder if that old man had some. And all those preachers made fun of them right out of the ministry. Their kids are out of the ministry. The kids are in sin. The kids got bastard babies. Huh. I don't think it pays to laugh at a man that believes in holiness. You understand what I'm saying? But he preached on holier the harder. He preached on the beauty of holiness versus the beauty of Hollywood. See, I remember that old man. Those three separate messages I told you about that old man preached. I heard him preach a message on the flesh. It was about 30 years old, and it blew the tape recorder up. <laughs> <laughs> he preached that down at White Plains. He preached on the flesh, and he got to go with that tape recorder. I mean, it's just gone. That old man preached, man. Wow, he preached. He hated flesh. He preached on flesh. My flesh ain't, all flesh is grass. There's a difference between children of obedience and children of disobedience. There's a difference. And God wants that distinction. We're living in a time. Mike Keenan preached on a generation without distinction. Yeah. We're removing all the distinctions. You know what I've seen today? I about barfed. There's a bunch of people getting ready to buy Halloween costumes. Guess what a, one of the so-called new up-and-coming uh, costumes is for Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. Caitlin Gender. Wow. Can you imagine that? Well, at least they got the monster part there. Yeah, you got Amen. Amen. <laughs> Give him a Buckeye leaf. He scored. Amen. In case you're wondering what he said on tape, he said at least they got the monster part right. Amen. <laughs> Praise God, that was good. I like that. It always seems to turn back on it. Amen. Let's go to back to Colossians there. Colossians and Ephesians are parallel. They go along side by side. They feed off each other. They add a little bit to each other. They they duplicate each other, but they're they got a lot of good stuff. They're good parallel books. Ephesians and Colossians. We're gonna go there and again again in a minute, but Colossians chapter number 3, Mortify therefore your members. We already covered that. Uh, verse 6, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on children of obedience, a disobedience, in which ye also walked, past tense, sometime when ye what? Lived in, Lived in them. Amen. Listen, God doesn't want us to live in this junk. Get out. Well, we want to shack up. You know, if we get married, we, we'll lose a check. So, lose a check. Yeah. Amen? Well, you don't understand. Lose a check. Amen. Do right. You don't think God had blessed that? See, they don't think God had blessed it. They think the government will bless them a whole lot more, and they can live where? In the flesh, for the flesh, for the purpose of getting checks from the government. Wow. Man, get a job. Yeah. Work two jobs, three jobs. What? Yeah, well, I guess that'll check your heart out, won't it? Hey Amen. I work two jobs and then some. You said what? Yeah. Hey Amen. I work I work 52 to 55 hours a week. That's a job and a half. I work I got a fortunately I have a job to be able to work so I don't have to go to two different places to work. There's a bunch of men that I work with that both that work extra jobs. One guy leaves there and goes to Home Depot and works. Another guy leaves there and goes to the hospital and works. Another guy used to work there went and delivered pizzas. A lot of people got to work two jobs. You know what they're doing? Raising their family. You think it's easy to be able to afford Christian school? I don't get no vouchers. You got to work hard. You got to work extra to put kids through Christian school and do all that. And then pay rent and do things like that. And then I mow grass here. I get to deduct rent off of this place because I mow the grass here. Listen, we mow extra and do extra things to try to what? Earn cash. Work. I ain't letting somebody just, I ain't freeloading anywhere. I don't write prayer letters and tell nobody how much money I need. I never told anybody about my medical bills, never told anybody about my insurance bills. I don't write letters and tell nobody about what I need. But I know that's the convenient truth today for preachers to sit back and say, oh, I'm struggling little church. I ain't a struggling little church. 
They said, some preachers call up and say, we want to come help struggling little churches. I'm not a struggling little church. Do we look like we're struggling? Let me see. Do I look like I'm struggling? <laughs> right? Amen. Amen. Listen, I... I ain't trying to complain. I ain't trying to sing no, no sad songs. I'm just trying to say people got excuses why they don't want to live for God today and come out of this stuff. We can come out of the world. We can live for God. Amen. We don't have to go to all the events that the world's going to. Amen. We don't have to do all that the world's doing. The world says dance, and the Christians are going, okay, let's dance. I say I ain't dancing. The world said bow. I ain't bowing. The world said let's go. I ain't going. I don't go to their events. I could care. Listen, I haven't been to one carnival or fair in this town in 28 years. I don't plan on going. You don't want to go to the bacon festival, the strawberry festival, the sour crap? I could care less what they're doing. <laughs> you understand? I just, when the world says jump, I don't jump. Hey, man. I know that bothers people, but I, I just, I'm just trying to say, I don't want to be moved by the world. I don't want the world's events to move me. Amen. I think it would be neat if we could sit back in lawn chairs and sip, sip and tea and watch the nuclear bomb drop. There it comes. Amen. Ah, praise God. Right over there, right pat. It wouldn't bother me a bit. <laughs> I miss sitting there with Brother Lovell sitting out there at the, the fire, man, just watching it as the planes fly by and the wind blows in and the world blowing open. We're just sitting there enjoying Jesus. Amen. Roasting a hot dog, sipping tea. Amen. I want to get out somewhere I can go do that. Have me a little fire. Y'all come over with roast hot dogs, man. Amen. That'd be fun. Just sit around there. Brother Lovell used to have a Baptist nightclub. We'd sit around, sing, just sing songs about Jesus, have a hot dog, a marshmallow, just enjoy Christian fellowship. What the world just go by. Yeah. Amen. I don't live in the world no more. I don't want nothing to do with it. Listen, I love being with Christians and just fellowship with Christians, amen? In a couple of weeks, we're going to have dinner here, man, on a Sunday before Labor Day. Just have fellowship, just enjoying Christians. Amen. I can just sit and enjoy a Christian. Amen. I can sit in somebody's house and just enjoy them. Yeah. I have to do with this world. Listen, the world's always got to have an activity. I don't have to have an activity. Amen? Amen. <laughs> The world lived in this. They can't understand how we, we can live without that. They don't know what to do. They're always looking for an activity. Right? I don't live in this stuff. Anymore. I live in God. I live in Christ. Listen, I want to be around Christians. I want to be around where preaching's at. God loves preaching. I want to be around preaching. God loves good gospel singing. I'm not talking about Christian concerts. I'm talking about good godly singing where they're edifying God. And then they bring in a preacher and preach, man. Yeah. Amen? Good godly singing is only preparing hearts for old time preaching. Right. Amen. Amen. Listen, there are a lot of these guys, they, they, they want to come in and sing. A lot of these singers want to sing, but they don't want to sit there and hear preaching. Yeah, My on. preacher warned me about that very first yeah. thing. He said, son, these singing groups go out all night Saturdays, and then they don't want to come in. They want to sit under preaching. That's what they want to do. They don't want to sit under preaching. Amen. I believe in old time preaching. All right, we went through the list. I'm getting in trouble. I can't repeat nothing. <laughs> Verse 8, But now you also put off these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off who? The old man. The old man, comma, with his deeds. You can put duds there too if you want. <laughs> Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. <laughs> I'm just talking about putting on some things, putting off some things. God, listen, I, 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 this is the passage, Ephesians 4. You get a brand new convert, a lot of people want to sit back and do a dress code on them real fast. I say the Holy Ghost take care of the dress code. Yeah, but here's the thing, a lot of people want to talk to them about their haircut. I say the Holy Ghost tell them about it. If you read 1 Corinthians 14 over there, it says we have no such customers as there be any contention. Yeah. When you, get, when you get down to it, what's a new convert supposed to do? What is he supposed to do? Get close to God. Amen. The bottom line is God's got something right here in Ephesians chapter number 4 that's for every new convert if they get a hold of it. And I know a bunch of preachers out there think this is strong meat. This is as simple as it gets. Amen. A brand new convert, what are they supposed to do? Ephesians chapter number 4. Verse... Uh, uh, 21, if so be that you have heard of him and have been taught by him as 
As the truth is where? In Jesus. You want the truth? Where's it at? In Jesus. It's in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You want to get rid of Jesus Christ? You'll get rid of the truth. Right. Right? Now look at what it says. Verse 22. That you what? Put off. Put off concerning the former conversation. That's lifestyle. That's not just what you talk about. It's how you live. God says the way you live before you got saved, I want some changes made in the way you live. Pretty simple. Right? I went to a bar. I was shooting pool with my bosses. And I'm shooting pool. I got all three bosses. We're up there shooting pool. And this time when I went in to go drink after I got right with the Lord, the Lord says, you don't get a Coke. So I got a little, little six and a half ounce Cokes. And I'm sitting there sipping on a little six and a half ounce Coke while my bosses and them are shooting pool. And I'm waiting for my turn. And the Holy Ghost came up to me in the bar. You believe the Holy Ghost went to a bar? He went to the bar, and the Holy Ghost showed up in the bar. You know what he said? He goes, what are you drinking? I said, well, I'm drinking a Coke. He goes, why are you drinking a Coke? I said, Christians ain't supposed to drink. He said, if Christians ain't supposed to drink, what are you doing in a place that they do it? And I said, that's a good point. <laughs> you know what? The Holy Ghost came to me. Not the Baptist preacher. The Holy Ghost came to me and said, hey, you need to quit shooting pool with these guys in the bar. You'll never guess what the Holy Ghost did to me after that, after I left. He told me to go to all three of those bosses and tell them why I won't be going back to the bar with them. And I went to each one of their bosses and I said, Mr. Stout, I recently got right with the Lord and gave my life to Lord Jesus Christ. I won't be going back to shoot pool with you at the bar. Do you know the Lord? You ever been saved? <sighs> Put your job on the line. Hey, Tommy. I said, I recently got right with the Lord. I won't be going back to the bar to shoot pool with you anymore. Do you know the Lord, Tommy? Hey, Gary. I won't be going back to the bar shooting pool with you anymore. I got right with the Lord. I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm not going to be drinking no more. She know the Lord. That's a brand new convert. Got right with the Lord. And God sent me back to the bar to go back and tell my bosses why I won't be drinking with them anymore. See, that was all preparation for me to become here. <laughs> to stand behind the pulpit, to have guts to stand up and take a stand against my former lifestyle and call up my buddies and call up my dad and they laugh at me and say, oh, so you're a redneck now. I said, yeah, I'm a redneck. Oh, you're a Jesus freak. Yeah, I'm a Jesus freak. Amen? Listen, have people cuss you, amen, for living for the Lord and standing up and read. somebody come out and see me reading my Bible at break and cuss me out for reading my Bible. Listen, all that stuff's preparation for you to stand up for the Lord. Listen, what'd you do? You put off the old man, what? The former conversation, the way of life. The old man, see? That's what the Bible says. It's an old man. It's dead. It's gone. Get rid of that guy. Amen? Bury him. Do all you can to disassociate yourself from that lifestyle. Everybody gets mad. You don't have to be belligerent. You don't have to be ugly. Just start living for God. Come in and say, man, I got saved last night and just watch the crowd just dissipate. Amen. I was sitting there bowling, minding my own business. I'm changed. I got a haircut and I got different. I'm dressed a little bit different. I'm up there bowling. Amen. I roll me a shot. You know, I come back and I'm standing there and I'm not smoking no more. And this guy come up, got the, the number one bowler in the whole league in, in both bowling alleys. Come up and said, man, what's happened to you? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you haircut, you dress different, you're, you're not cussing anymore. What's going on? I said, well, give my heart to the Lord. Oh, he was gone. Amen. They started noticing. You give your life to the Lord. And man, see, listen, they started dropping like flies. They didn't want to be around me no more. I wasn't sitting back saying, hey, man, you know that beer in your hands is going to send you to hell? I didn't say that. I didn't have to say none of that. They just noticed I wasn't participating no more. They begin to notice a change in me. Next thing you know, they begin to mock me at work. And I pull my little New Testament out and I be reading it. And they say, here comes the Pope. See, wow. that was, I'm, listen, they, 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 they knew there was transformation. And then I got right. And when I got called to preach and then we was having revival and I began to invite people to revival, all of a sudden they come out with all these new rules and regulations. You're not allowed to pass out literature. That was all hidden and suppressed until I got right with God and began to invite everybody in the warehouse to church. 
Amen. But every one of them got a gospel track. I hunt them down until I find one. I say, here, man, I want to tell you about Jesus. And when I got right, I had to go to all them black guys and stick my hand out to them. I said, would you forgive me? And ask each one of them, forgive me, and shook their hands. I said, I got right with the Lord the other night. Would you forgive me? Listen, that's some guts. But you know what? God was preparing me to take a stand and go face my enemies and tell them some things about Jesus Christ. I wasn't being ugly. I wasn't being belligerent. But I had to draw some lines. You know what? That former conversation got away with it. Say, what happened? I got in church. Say, what happened? The church was having jail service on Friday nights. Guess what? I can't bowl on Friday night. Why? The church is going to jail. I wasn't called to preach. Didn't go to preach. But the church was going. Guess what? I showed up to go to, church, to, go to the jail. Hey, Amen. I showed up to jail. I'm standing there with a song. Hey, Amen. I'll never forget the first song I heard when I was in jail. Oh, I want to see him. Just look upon his face. <laughs> hey Amen. I remember that. I went with Brother Bill Brown. Brother Bill Brown preached that night. Hey Amen. What? And then next thing you know, they're having they're having churches meeting, going to the nursing home on Monday night. I said, Well, I can't bowl on Monday night. Their church is going to nursing home. So I showed up in nursing home. I'm down there, man. I'm sitting there watching them bring in all them folks in the wheelchairs and everything. I'm just there. So what? Church is there. Man, I, my whole life changed, man. Everything. What? The church? Let's go. Next thing I surrendered to preach, and Brother Bill Brown come up and said, we knew you was called to preach. We just couldn't tell you when you was going to surrender. I said, everybody's seen it in my life. Why? Because I come and got in. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? They said the same thing about John Mitchell. John Mitchell got in, and uh, he got saved. And, and next thing you know, he's at WMU, that Southern Baptist for Women's Missions Union or something, Missionary Union. And uh, all the women are gathered, and there's Brother John Mitchell sitting back there, you know. <laughs> and they go, Brother John, what are you doing? He said, well, I heard he was having church, man. I wanted to come. And he said, well, this is a woman's meeting. He said, WMU, WM what? He said, ah, nothing, brother. And he was coming, and uh, he got saved. All he knew is he wasn't going to hell. About three weeks into his salvation, a preacher got up about, now that we're saved, we're going to heaven. Brother John goes, what? We're going to heaven too? I knew I was saved we're going to hell, but I didn't know I was getting to heaven too. Woo! And he was just having a spell. <laughs> you understand? What? Life has changed, man. It's from walking in from darkness to light. The lights are on. I mean, I left that lifestyle. Amen. I don't want nothing to do with it. I got I got right, went up to my grandpa died and went up there to go see my sister and my brother in law gets out of a car and he walks all the way around the driveway, around the cars and goes in. Didn't want nothing to do with me. Why? Because I got saved. I'm converted. Don't want nothing to do with me. Why? Because my lifestyle changed. He likes his dope, he likes his booze, he likes all that junk. He don't want nothing to do with it. His life's a wreck today. Thirty five years later. I'm saved living the good life. They ain't got it. Amen. You would think they'd say, what do you got? Something happened to you 35 years ago. Man, it's been going strong. Man, I could sure use a dose of whatever you got. No, their pride's keeping them down. Amen. My lifestyle changed. I put off the old man. Get rid of him. I don't want nothing to do with it. God told me to go out there and burn all that rock and roll and take those marijuana plants and those rock and roll shirts and that, all that junk. And I held on to that leather jacket for four years. I don't know why I held on to it for five years. And finally, I wound up dealing with a guy about that lifestyle. And the day I surrendered to preach, I wound up, threw it on the altar and died. I said, he's dead. Got rid of him. I carried that leather jacket around just in case I ever got a bike and ever needed to ride it. And God said, you're keeping dragging around a corpse. What are, you bringing, what are you toting that thing around for? God, maybe get rid of that. There's other things in my life, and she can bear witness to, that God told me to get rid of that was attached to that old life. I just have to get rid of that stuff. Amen. Put off what? The former conversation. Amen. The old man, which is what? A blessing, right? Which is corrupt. Which is corrupt. See, a lot of men don't want to, listen, let me, I was thinking about this today. I'm going to build a message on it one day. I was thinking about this. The Bible said there's none good. No, not one. So that means you're what? Bad. How many people really want to admit they're a bad person? I mean, you want, to, you, want to rub, you want to rub the cat's hair the wrong way. Half people have to sit back and really admit, I am a bad woman. I am a bad man. I am a bad child. 
if you're going to take God's side against yourself. And to get people to admit, well, you know, I mean, you know, <laughs> listen, people have a hard time accepting it that there's none, good, no, not one. That means God's included 7 billion people into that category that's alive now. They ain't counting that's ever lived. And he's concluding them all under sin. And there's none good, no, not one. That means they're all bad. And you know what? We're his what? Creation. It means we're all rejects. Oh, man. He's rejected us. He's rejected our first birth. He's rejected all our righteousness, all our good. We're rejects. That man, man just can't swallow that. People, have said, I mean, I watched that one lady walk out of Jimmy Hood. She said, I've never seen him. And man, and then she goes, I just lied, didn't I? And she left weeping. I couldn't, I couldn't chase her down and get her in there. She thought, she honestly came down to convince me she'd never sinned. And when I was done talking to her, she realized she sinned. And she lied to me right there. And she said, I can't believe God sent me to hell for that. And ran out of that place screaming. I'm telling you, it's... it's to tell her that she was a sinner and she was bad, she don't see herself bad. And that's what old time preaching has got to do. That's what old time conviction has got to do. It's got to get people in a place where they see they're bad, see they're wrong. That's what, that's what old fashioned preaching does. It rubs the flesh. Why? Because we're corrupt. Amen? I couldn't wait to get to the shower tonight because I could smell myself. Would you turn your nose up? You ever smell yourself? Huh? You know it's bad when you can smell yourself. Yeah. You worked hard, you go, man, I need a bath. Yeah. Right? That's what? I mean, you never been there yet? I ain't worked you hard yet. I'm going to start working you now. <laughs> and I'm going to work you to where you smell yourself. Amen? <laughs> Hello? Right? It's, look at what he says, which is corrupt according to what? That's, that's where it's all at. It's about our lust. Where's our lust organized at? In our heart. we got a bad heart. It's our flesh. Look what it says. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He put on the new man, which is after God, creating righteousness and true holiness. Verse 25. Wherefore, put away your cigarettes. What's the first thing he tells a young man, a young woman right there to get saved? Put away lying. Put away lying. He says... Get rid of the con. Quit lying. Quit cheating. You don't know. You don't have to connive and manipulate anymore in your life. Shoot straight. Be honest. That's the number one thing. The first thing God's really telling a person to do when they get saved. Be honest. Put away lying. You don't have to impress nobody anymore. You don't have to say nothing anymore. Just tell the truth. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. Amen. Put away lying. Every man, speak every man the truth, what? With his neighbor, for he remembers one. Be angry and what? Sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole what? Steal no, no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may what? Had to give. You know what's the problem with a thief? He's covetous. One of the best tests if he's truly repented, he'll give away. Right? There's a man in your Bible in Luke 19 that was stealing people's money unjustly. You know who he was? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. He was taking more money than he needed to because he's a publican, he's a tax collector. And he said, Lord, if I've wronged anybody, I'll give them what? Fourfold. That's a sign a guy repented. Yep. When he's so covetous, he's taking and taking and taking. He's jipping. He's always pushing the scales to lean his direction. And he said, Lord, I've done wrong here. I'll give, I'll give him out of my own pocket. I'll, get, I'll make sure I get this thing right. I'll even go up to four times the amount. Woo, this guy really got some. Amen. Boy, that'd tell you something, wouldn't it? Sound like he got right. Lanny Hasbrook, when he got right with God, Amen. He, he got away from God and, and God was calling to preach and he got away when he got right with God. Guess what he did? He paid all his back ties. Got caught up. Said, all the years I was out of church, this is what I missed by tithing. And he paid it all. You know what God did? God put him in the ministry. You know what Lanny Hasbrook did? Amen. He quit smoking 61 times. 
He went back 60. <laughs> he finally quit the 61st time. God gave him the victory. You know what he kept doing? He kept fighting that thing. Kept fighting that thing. Amen. Now he's in heaven. Amen. Let him stole, steal no more. Rather, let him what? Labor. Amen. Working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now watch this. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of what? Your mouth. But that which is good to edify, that it may minister grace and hear, is grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you're sealed on day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking what? Be put away from you, comma, with all malice. That's that ill will, that's that junk, that enmity that sits in your heart. That, that's, it's actually taking all that issues of your life and cooking it. You're sitting there cooking it, stirring it, keeping it hot, <coughs> making it thick. And then, and then when you have the chance, you dip your darts in that stuff. And when somebody comes by, you jab them with it to put that poison in there, see. That's what malice is. It's that poison coming out of the heart. I'm going to stick it. Amen. Be ye kind one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake forgiven you. Listen, there's just some things we got to put away. This is just, we're not even scratching the surface. And there's things we ought to be putting on in the passage. But I'm just saying God wants that old man done away with. He wants that old nature. He don't want nothing of Adam be resembled in our life. All he wants to see is Christ. And that's what we're going to get into maybe sometime in the next five weeks, that we're going to put on Christ and people are to see Christ. And we're to put on the things that resemble him. And there's things, there's, there's equipment in our lives that we need that, that resembles him, that helps us walk and be like him. And if we don't put those things on, we're in trouble. And I think the average Christian and the average church is struggling because they don't believe in putting on these things. Listen, it's a little cool in here because Mrs. Parks likes church, Igloo Baptist Church. Amen. And, uh, but you know what you ladies done? You put on something to, to warm up. Instead of complaining about it, you said, we'll just make adjustments. Well, in a Christian life, you've got to make adjustments. And there's things that we lack that just don't come with the goods now that we're saved. And we must put them on. There's things, listen, the Holy Ghost comes. He's, part, he's in and there. But there's things that he needs to work with. Right. And if we don't put ourselves in a position to have him work with those things, we're going to be empty. We're going to be void. We're going to be barren. Amen. Uh, I mean, listen, you can have the Holy Ghost all you want, but if you don't do what John 15 says, abide in Christ, you can forget it. You ain't going to bear no fruit. Right? You got a comforter, but you don't access yourself to the comforter, and you want to worry all day long, the comforter ain't going to do his job. If you want to sit there and wear that, burn that, uh, get you 100 miles per rocking chair. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people then. They worry. They wear that little rocking chair out. They pace back and forth. They worry. Listen. Worry ain't supposed to be a part of Christian life. Amen. We're supposed to cast all burdens upon the Lord. We're to tell Him about it. The Holy Ghost can't help nobody that want, don't want to. I mean, Jesus is there to carry the burdens. If we don't cast our burdens to the Lord, He'll just say, "Okay, carry it. Crush, let it crush you." Amen. And then He may even stack a few more on there. So, okay, I'll just let it break you. Lord, the straw broke my back. Well, what are you doing carrying all that? Yeah. You weren't meant to carry them. I'm meant to carry them. Give them to me. You understand? So listen, we can, we can go against the Holy Ghost even though we've been equipped with them. Amen? And a lot of Christians do that. And they don't allow God to carry the burden. They don't cast a burden to the Lord. And when they do bring things down, it's like my briefcase got a handle on it. They bring it down to the altar and then they pick it back up and they go back home with it. They just have a problem just leaving it with the Lord. So there's things that we need to do and there's things that the Holy Ghost needs, equipment that he tells us to have, right? Like shield of faith. So there's a lot of things. And he says that we might quench all yeah. the fiery darts of wicked, not just some of the darts. Amen. All the darts. He doesn't want a dart to get through. Right. And part of the way for a dart not to get through, it's not his fault. He said, told you to be circumspect mm -hmm. and to walk circumspectly. You know what walking circumspectly means? Be aware. It's circular. It means you're to have eyes in the back of your head and the side of your head, right? You're to be circumspect. You're to, you're to be observant. Yep. Well, Lord, that blindsided me. Why did it blindside you? Right. Okay. Well, I was trusting you to look. You're to be circumspect. You understand? Be like me pulling out in front of a car 
and say, Priscilla, you didn't warn me. It's not her responsibility to warn me about oncoming traffic. It's my responsibility, right? And even if she tells me traffic's fine, what am I supposed to do? Look anyway. I'm supposed to still look. Why? Because that means I'm a good driver then because I just can't take people's words for things, especially if I'm the one that's behind the wheel and I'm in control. I can't tell the police officer or the judge, well, I just pulled out because they said it was clear. What do you mean it's clear? Gabriel, go ahead and pray.